Thank you. That was great. Uh, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Paul. Really, really, really wonderful. So, uh, Shakespeare once said, "The past is prologue." Um, to understand the third wave, we're going to rewind to the first wave for a quick little video, and uh, we'll get on with the rest of the program after. You've got mail. Can you explain what internet is? Cutting edge of technology. The internet is now big enough to matter. We launched a new and improved White House website. What is this main artery of the information superhighway? The internet. Going surfing on the internet. first wave really was just building the internet, building the infrastructure, the software, the servers, the networks, just getting people comfortable and kind of getting them on that on-ramp to the, the internet. The second wave has been building on top of the internet, building the apps and the mobile connections that allow you to do things that really start improving your life. The third wave is really integrating the internet into every aspect of our lives in increasingly seamless and sometimes even invisible ways. Now, how does it change healthcare? How does it change education? How does transportation, energy, food? I wanted to make sure whether you're an entrepreneur trying to think about a company in the third wave or whether you're a corporate executive trying to figure out how to position your company for the third wave or even if you're a policymaker in government. Steve Case, who from the day I came to office has been working with me uh, on promoting entrepreneurship here in the United States and, and now overseas. Steve exemplifies what it means to be an entrepreneur. So he's the perfect messenger for this aid, which is anybody can be an entrepreneur. Anybody can connect to technology. And as Steve goes around talking about the third way, he inspires people to be part of that. Uh, our winner is Parkex. Stuff is not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a lot of long days, long nights, a lot of disappointment. But we believe that if we put in the time now, we'll see the reward later. I think it's worth remembering that 250 years ago, America itself was a startup. And now, fast forward 250 years, uh, we're the leader of the free world because we have the leading economy. I think that can continue, but it's not guaranteed. That's one of the reasons I wrote this book, to try to provide a roadmap to help people navigate through this third way. So that's the past. Uh, we just heard from the present. And now we're going to spend the rest of the day talking about the future. So the startups you saw and the trends you heard Steve talking about are really going to happen across the country from leaders who are building incubators, accelerators, programs, seed funds, mentoring. And we're going to hear from people across the country that have a vision of what that looks like in their community. And to kick off the third wave of our three-wave program, uh, we are going to invite Wendy Gillis, the CEO of the Kauffman Foundation, to come and talk a little bit about what Kauffman is seeing. The, so the UN Kauffman Foundation is a, is a great partner of ours, and they have probably done more than any other foundation or organization to support entrepreneurs across America over the last couple of decades. So Wendy, thank you so much for being a wonderful partner, and tell us where we are headed. Uh, well, thank you. Thanks, Ross, and good afternoon to everyone. It is a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's great to see Steve Case. Uh, we've had a great, productive working relationship over the year between our foundations, and what a treat it was to meet Jim Sorensen. He is such an incredible asset, not only in terms of what he did as an entrepreneur, but how he is giving back to help this community and this region and this country, frankly. So um, the topic today uh, that we've been addressing is really so important, and that is how do we grow the number and quality of young firms across this country, not just in a few select places. And that's a pursuit that we at the foundation strive to fulfill every day. And we do that because our founder, his name was Ewing Kaufman, he put us on this path years ago before words like entrepreneurship or startup were common household terms. Uh, Ewing Kaufman would have turned 100 this September. And I think if he looked out and was here today and saw the collection of talent in this room, he'd be very pleased. People that are eager to listen and learn and contribute and make sure that entrepreneurs across the country have an equal shot 
to succeed in building their businesses. Last month, the foundation issued its State of Entrepreneurship Report in Washington, D.C., and although we highlighted some concerns, we're optimistic about the future of entrepreneurship in America. You can check out our new entrepreneurial growth agenda on our website at Kaufman.org. Among the concerns we shared, though, the rate of new business creation in the United States today is about 50% lower than it was in the 1980s, 50%. And while media coverage of the tech sector would lead you to believe that companies like Airbnb or Uber are ubiquitous, the reality is there are fewer of these high growth firms than there were in the past, and they appear to be growing more slowly. However, there are encouraging signs that the U.S. is on the verge of an entrepreneurial boom, and you heard Steve talk about some of those reasons today. Entrepreneurs are transforming, as we've heard, large parts of the U.S. economy, including banking, automobiles, insurance, and health care. And the barriers to entrepreneurship will continue to fall as well, driven by the spread of software, higher computing power, and cheaper server storage. Demography, uh, demography comes into play, too. The U.S. is about to experience a surge of labor market entry thanks to the millennial generation. And as millennials reach their peak age of business creation, which is their late 30s and early 40s, we're bound to see a burst of startup activity. I believe, however, that for us to really optimize these opportunities, we have to take a hands-on approach to supporting our entrepreneurs, and that's why we're here today. As Mr. Kaufman once said, one thing an entrepreneur has to learn is that you cannot do it all yourself. So a big part of our mission at the foundation is to work directly to help entrepreneurs to succeed. And we do this by identifying where the application of our resources, our people, our ideas, and our capital can serve society in significant and measurable ways by developing innovative research-based programs that can lead to practical, sustainable solutions that can be widely accepted and implemented. And finally, by partnering with others to leverage our resources and capabilities while reducing the creation of dependency. We know that entrepreneurs are critical to the long-term health of this economy, and you've heard the oft-quoted stat today about all the investment dollars or the majority of them flowing into three states. Um, but yet, you know, the math doesn't add up because the majority of the talent and the majority of the market do not lie in those three areas. And that's not a good equation for the long term, so we have to work to level the playing field. That means advancing entrepreneurship programs and education, promoting startup friendly policies, and working to really understand what young firms need. Over the last several years, the Kauffman Foundation has supported several initiatives to help entrepreneurs across the country, such as our own One Million Cups program and, of course, Village Capital. We've also highlighted and invested in specific communities, including in our own hometown of Kansas City, that are building vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystems. These communities are not trying to compete with Silicon Valley. Rather, they're developing their own versions of entrepreneurial hotbeds by leveraging their unique local strengths. There's also a new wave of innovation taking place right now, and we've heard it from the entrepreneurs here today in more highly regulated sectors, healthcare, education, agriculture, water, energy, and fintech. And cities across the U.S. are well positioned to help build successful companies outside of those traditional major markets. That's why the Kauffman Foundation is really pleased to support village capital communities. Vilcap Communities showcases best-in-class entrepreneur development organizations around the United States that are taking advantage of unique local resources to find and support the best entrepreneurs in their communities. It offers support to these organizations by drawing on the curriculum, network, and program management platform established through the past seven years and 40 programs that Village Capital has launched around the world. And perhaps most importantly, Vilcap Communities is not here to tell you how to succeed. You are doing that on your own. Rather, they're here to shine a spotlight on your work and help drive more resources so it's easier for you to build robust entrepreneurial ecosystems. Ultimately, the Kauffman Foundation's vision of success is that entrepreneurs across the country have an equal shot to succeed in building a business and giving back to their own communities, just like Mr. Kaufman did in Kansas City. And who knows, there might be someone in this room today who will someday own a small market World Series baseball team, like he did. <laughs> we need to make sure that there are more entrepreneurial ecosystems that allow entrepreneurs to flourish and to give back and village capital communities is core to that approach. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me, and I look forward to learning from you today. Thank you, Wendy. So I also want to welcome people from around the world to our live stream. Um, it is great to have people everywhere see 
what is going on all across the country. Um, I want to tell you how the next little bit is going to go. We have, remember, we've worked all across the country. We see the four Ps that really make a startup ecosystem work. And everybody here has really excelled in one of those. So we're going to group them by Ps. Again, again, makes them easier to remember and get your head around, but also talks about what these, these folks are bringing to, to the table. So the fur, we're gonna have in four different groups, um, different cities, about four city per group, show what they are doing, what is going on from Philadelphia to Baltimore and everywhere, everywhere in between. Uh, they were actually very close to each other, so that was not, probably Portland to Honolulu, how's that? And everyone, but that was better. Um, and uh, you can follow along with the hashtag reinventvc. Um, and one thing I wanna say is, it is really hard to be an entrepreneur. It is even harder to be an entrepreneur that is building an organization that is supporting entrepreneurs. It's like hard in a meta way. And so when you come up here, I want you to appreciate everything these people are doing to improve their city, improve the world by giving them a standing ovation. It's a lot of thankless days that these folks have and today is not one of them. Um, we are gonna thank you for all you've done. So um, the partnerships group is pulling together government, universities, corporates, all these people are doing great things with big, slow-moving institutions that they've gotten to focus on a few great things for entrepreneurs. And first up, if you cannot make a partnership work in the city of brotherly love, you probably can't make it work anywhere. Come up, our representative from Philadelphia, tell us what you got, and let's give him a standing ovation. I'm here with my colleague Omar Menson, and we are from the fabulous city, the fabulous rise of the rest city of Philadelphia. A lot of enduring images about Philadelphia. I have a problem with this one. You know what the biggest problem I have with it? It's 40 years old, folks. It's what the city looks like now. The skyline's changed a bit. Philadelphia is an ever-developing, ever-thriving community. Unfortunately, with that development and that diversity of commerce and, and corporate and entrepreneurship development, there are some serious economic challenges that need to be addressed in our city too. We have the highest poverty rate of any of the top five cities and we have a serious educational infrastructure issue. Ben Franklin Technology Partners, my organization, the organization I represent, has been on the front line of the impact economy way before it was a thing. And the one thing that we believe very strongly is that technology-based entrepreneurship can affect change, can affect serious socioeconomic change, even within, even within a diverse, decentralized economy. Philadelphia is a city of tight communities. We have the infrastructure and relationships to scale young, good ideas quickly. Ben Franklin is the most active seed investor in that community. We have a privilege of being pretty, pretty well-known nationwide for our contribution, too. The biggest problem that we've identified, um, I will dare anybody to find the purple line on these bars that represent startup and seed stage capital. If you can't, and if you have trouble with it, you have just identified the biggest problem that entrepreneurs all over the country are having, especially in Philadelphia. It's hard to find. And guess what, folks? My organization's in it. We know how hard it is to find. How do we address this problem? We do well by doing good. We apply the capital, counsel, and connections by investing and de-risking startup enterprises so that other investors can come on board. We've got a great track record on this. I mentioned 34 years. This one I'm especially proud of because if you take a look and think about Enrico Moretti's 2012 point suggesting that every tech-based job creates five other jobs, that's a pretty good number. That's something we can be proud of. It's proof that it works. Why are we here as part of Village Capital Communities? To connect with all of you. There's learnings that we have to share, but there are so many great ideas that we want to bring back to make our city great. We're focused on FinTech for our, for our VillCap Communities initiative. Why FinTech? Pretty honestly, we love the pipeline, but we love the regional ingredients that, that are there to make this work. 
We love the fact that we have a deep analytics and B2B development focus within our IT community. There's a healthcare system and a healthcare infrastructure that's working, looking on, looking to find ways to reevaluate the whole payor payee relationship very closely. Our partnerships are deep, but we're partnering in addition with Village Capital. Local, we have local uh, co-investment programs with a lot of the major universities, as well as deep relationships with all of the corporate and startup infrastructure in the community. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. That was, that was spectacular. So um, first of all, uh, that, was, that was great. We are going to have some feedback from the folks we've heard from today, from Wendy and from Steve and from Jim. We're going to do this in a group. So we're going to have about four communities go, and then Wendy and Steve and Jim will provide general commentary on what they noticed, and then we will do that for the next, the next group of communities. Um, not that far from, from Philadelphia, a longtime National League rival, um, the city on the Ohio River has pulled together a great public-private city-based uh, collaboration, building a center of excellence in water. Let's hear from Cincinnati and a standing ovation. You can do it. You can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Are we working? We good? Great. Uh, well, good afternoon. I'm Eric Weissman from Centrifuge. Uh, very proud to represent uh, Startup Cincy and uh, the Cincinnati effort as we kick off our village capital community effort. Uh, Cincinnati has a long history with water. Uh, it's, where, it's why the river, uh, the city was founded on the Ohio River. We also have the oldest municipally owned water system in the country. Um, the, the partners in Cincinnati also, we like to work with each other. We have a culture of collaboration. We feel that uh, all boats rise uh, when we work together to move things forward. And then finally, we really have an unfair advantage when it comes to those natural resources. We've got the Ohio River. The Miami Valley Aquifer is 300 million gallons of water that runs through the entire topography and thousands of miles of rivers and streams that feed into it. So seriously, I ask you, where would you rather test water tech? On the left is uh, an event called Paddle Fest that happens on the Ohio River every year. And on the right is a uh, nondescript uh, stream bed in somewhere in Southern California. Uh, the organizations that we have uh, helping us out in this effort are really uh, an all-star team of effort. Uh, Xavier University, uh, their Center for Innovation, and a group called Confluence, which is one of 15 um, tech, water tech clusters in the United States, uh, responsible for over 250 water tech patents uh, just out of Cincinnati, which is more than the entire state of Kentucky. Uh, so Confluence is a big reason uh, for our success, as well as the US EPA. Uh, the regional headquarters is in Cincinnati. Uh, and then we're looking forward to involving the rest of Startup Cincy, which is our uh, name for the rest of the entrepreneur ecosystem. Uh, it's kind of like the NBA All-Star Team, which I call like the no defense game. Uh, but I prefer to think of it as the, uh, the dream team, just a really a dominant force to be reckoned with. That's why it's important for us to be a part of uh, Village Capital and why we're very, very much looking forward. Uh, we've already started networking with some of our peer city, cities, talking to the folks up the, up the river, as it were, in Milwaukee, uh, looking for some deal flow and some, some help with some of the applications there. But we also appreciate that problem-based approach to learning and the continued halo effect of being a rise of the rest city uh, will, will do us very good. Uh, the program will be quite uh, similar, but one of the unique things that we're going to do is have different locations. So we're going to borrow some office space from the United States EPA, as well as on the campus of Xavier University and our headquarters uh, in downtown Cincinnati, a place very similar to this impact hub in Salt Lake. So one of the ways that we're going to measure success, obviously two companies are going to come out of this with funding. We hope the rest of them stick around, maybe go through some of the other nine accelerators that are part of Cincinnati, uh, solve the world's problems, and then create this halo effect, this flywheel effect, that success begets success. Um, we want to continue to leverage our unique assets and uh, continue to become the premier destination for water tech entrepreneurs in the Midwest. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thanks so much. So we really like cities that build on what they know. Um, tell me a product from Milwaukee. Beer. What is the largest uh, ingredient in beer? Water. So Cincinnati already kind of tipped Milwaukee's hand on what they're working on. Um, but 
let's have Scott from the Water Council of Milwaukee tell us what uh, the brew crew are up to. Take it away. Let's give him a standing ovation. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Mosley. I'm the Director of Investments at the Water Council in Milwaukee, and we're working on beer. Yeah. We're having a beer accelerator, right? So everybody's going to come out of the 3-2 stuff here to Milwaukee and get <laughs> real beer, right? No, um, actually, my friends, these three sectors are changing radically. The way we produce energy, the way we grow food, where we grow food, and the way we ration water will not real will not uh, be what you think it is today in the next 20 years. It is changing dramatically, and it will change all of our lives. So I, I have the unique pleasure of being the only person ever to speak at the Federal Reserve Bank and putting up a, a slide with Laverne and Shirley on it. So if you don't know who Laverne and Shirley is, this is a sitcom from the 70s about Laverne and Shirley who work at the mythical Stotts Brewery in Milwaukee. The show runs seven years, and at the end of the seven years, the brewery closes, Laverne and Shirley are out of work, and they pack up their bags, and they move to Santa Monica to try to be actors. And most people think that that's the story of the upper Midwest. It's dying. But that's not true. It's only half the story. The first half of the story started in the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s when we had waves of immigration coming from northern Europe, and they brought one key ingredient, one key thing that we know very well, and that's beer. And they brought the knowledge of, of, of brewing beer at industrial scale. And around that industry grew the ancillary industries, pumps, valves, meters, filters, control systems, boilers. And today, those ancillary industries are now our core industries. And that is why we have more food production per capita than anywhere in the United States. We have the largest industry cluster of water technology in the United States. And we have world-class energy power control systems companies like Johnson Controls and Eaton. Unfortunately, that does not lead to a culture of entrepreneurship. We have significant problems, as Wendy will tell us. Wisconsin ranks 49, 50 in the index, something like that. But we don't have capital, and we know that these things are hard to bring to market. So four of the leading organizations in Milwaukee, the Water Council, CSA Partners, the Commons, the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee have banded together to join the Village Capital Communities Program, and we're trying to take this problem head on. And so this is the work that we've done collectively over the past three years, and we are excited to launch our, our Village Capital Program this summer, where we will be doing a boot camp around these systems, food, water, and energy, trying to help entrepreneurs, particularly academic entrepreneurs who often come with very good science, but not necessarily markets, to understand how to make go, no-go decisions. And so we would invite you to come and visit us in Milwaukee and have a real beer, or if you're flying to the coast, at least wave at us as you fly over. So we've got about nine seconds. Thanks very much. Uh, there are four of us here in the room, so we'd love to tell you more about the story of Milwaukee if, if we get a chance. Thanks. Great work. Thank you. Um, so finally, in the partnerships bracket, uh, we've got Savannah. Now, Savannah was not supposed to be here, but yesterday, uh, Savannah's team member had an emergency, and Savannah one day ago was told that she needed a pinch hit. So when you give Savannah your standing ovation a second, give her a really big one. But the most important thing about what Savannah and the team in Minneapolis are doing, Minneapolis is home to more Fortune 500 companies per capita than any other city. And we did the rise of the restaurant in Minneapolis, and there was kind of a frustration that the corporates weren't doing a lot with startups, and that's actually not unique to Minneapolis. That's a trend across the country. But these guys have built really, really effective and collaborative partnerships with big corporates, and uh, specifically around food and ag. So tell Savannah you're glad that she's here and not in Minneapolis by a big ovation. Step right up, Savannah. Hi, everyone. My name is Savannah Reesing, and I'm representing the Minnesota Cup and my great city of Minneapolis. And I'm going to share with you today why Minneapolis is the number one place in the world for you to start and grow a food and ag tech business. So first, what's, first of all, what's unique about Minneapolis is that our food community is open to a spectrum of food innovation. So what that means is that on one end of the spectrum, we're capitalizing on the natural and organic food trends. And on the other end, we're contributing to 
the breakthrough technology in ag agriculture technology that's changing the way of how we harvest and grow our food. So Minnesota's competitive advantage in the food space is that we have an abundance of talent and expertise in the food industry in the entire value chain. So what's unique about this is that um, some of the biggest key players in this value chain have their um, home in Minnesota. So that includes General Mills, Cargill, and Land O'Lakes. And more importantly, we have a growing ecosystem of food entrepreneurs in our state. The only thing that's lacking are the junior and senior entrepreneurs to provide mentorship to this ecosystem. So that's where Minnesota Cup comes in. And we have grown to be one of the largest statewide startup competitions in the country. And this year we'll be awarding over $400,000 in non-equity seed capital to Minnesota startups. And so we pull this all off by leveraging a pool of 350 volunteers. These are successful entrepreneurs and investors who serve as mentors and judges for our competition. Since the competition started, we've supported over 10,000 entrepreneurs, and the finalists in our competition have gone on to raise over $200 million. Um, we have eight divisions in our competition, and it was just a couple of years ago that General Mills approached us and asked us to start a food division. And in two years, the food division has grown to be the largest division in our competition. So we created a spin-off of that food division called Grow North, which is a resource hub specifically to support food startups in Minnesota. And we've also assembled a rock star team of public and private organizations to support the Grow North initiative and to back the VILCAP model. So in August, we'll have a cohort of 10 semifinalists from the food division of our competition who um, we've narrowed down, we will be narrowing down in our competition to go through the VILCAP process. And looking forward, we want to position Minnesota as the epicenter of food innovation. So to do this, we're launching that Grow North initiative and we're expanding our funding model by including an equity crowdfunding campaign in our competition. So the VILCAP model really, it fits perfectly with how we want to execute this vision. Thank you. Thank you, Savannah. All right, I'd like to invite our uh, feedback givers here to give some uh, thoughts on the first round. Um, we're gonna have the communities here. Uh, so you guys, if you can come join these seats here and just come on up real quick uh, and speak towards the crowd. You guys are gonna go over there. Um, we're gonna have about five minutes for this session. Um, and if you have comments or questions, keep this more, you guys give a comment and then we'll, we'll have time for as many questions as we have and we'll, we'll wrap up after about five minutes. But um, Bert is keeping time over there. Uh, so we will, we will uh, try and get as much good insights as we can after about a five minute period. So do you guys want to want to start? The technology is so difficult. Uh, first of all, great presentations, and uh, all, all were terrific. But particularly Savannah, pretty good for pinch hitting. You may, I don't know who the who the, the the normal hitter is, but maybe you should take over permanently. Uh, I was impressed by all four having a particular focus. You know, Philadelphia with fintech, and Minneapolis with food and ag tech, and it looks like we have a little bit of a smackdown battle going between Cincinnati and Milwaukee over water tech. But that that should be great because it needs a lot of a. Attention. The other thing I, we saw consistently was the partnerships within the cities coming together, a lot of different forces, including some of the companies, but other organizations to, to work together to drive these things uh, forward. So I think they're perfect examples of what I was talking about earlier in terms of the, the third wave. This is not about a photo app. You know, it's about real fundamental challenges and opportunities in our society, whether it be food or, or water or, or financial services. And it's, so therefore not surprising that this kind of focus is happening in, in these rise of the rest cities. Yeah, I, is mine working? Okay. Um, you know, I was really impressed by the presentations. I've, I've seen a number of these, and to pull these off within the time frame, and you're under, under stress, I mean, particularly Savannah, that was uh, very impressive. Um, I, uh, I felt like you all had a pretty good sense of, of your market. In other words, what, what are the assets that we have to, to leverage off of in your communities? 
um, and and then also building partnerships, which I think are going to be critical. Um, I had a sense uh, that that some of you that were further along in terms of you know, having those partnerships in place and the maturity of your program, you know, I think the Philadelphia program had a, a pretty impressive track record. Uh, you've been around for a while, and there's probably a lot that you can look, you, you teach others that are that are that are coming along. Uh, you know, Minneapolis also had some pretty good. Uh, you know, numbers there, um, and, um, you know, I think the, the wherever you can build off of each other's strength, I mean, that's really the, the, the genius behind the Village Capital Program in, in the peer uh, review um, uh, and learning process, uh, really take advantage of that. Um, but I think you're, you're all um, very impressive. And I look for great things in your communities. All right, I'll try to find something um, original here. I, I would say, uh, first of all, you're all great storytellers, great presenters, and that that's, gets you a long way. Um, the passion is amazing. So forget what I said about lower rates of startups. I'm super inspired by this. Um, I was impressed by um, each of you in, in different ways. You know, presenting the data, so you're looking for gaps and also leveraging your, your local assets. You're not trying to make something up. You're trying to use what's there and make the most of it. Um, you know, I think the, 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 you know, this is a group about collaboration and partnership, and that's super important, um, not just within your communities, but across the country. And, and I think with this program, as Jim was saying, you'll learn um, maybe there's another community doing, uh, you know, a different focus area, but the model or how they're applying it will be something that could be transferable. So um, great job. I wish you all luck. One other quick uh, comment. I was, I was thinking about uh, what I said earlier about, you know, 250 years ago, America was a startup. It's worth noting when we were on the Rise of the Rest Tour, we visited all four of these uh, states, but we were in Philadelphia. We did something at the Liberty Bell, which is really where it all got started. And it is worth citing a Ben Franklin uh, quote about the importance of, of uh, execution. He said, well done is better than well said. So a reminder that the idea is important, but you have to execute against the idea. So thank you, Ben Franklin, arguably not just the founder of the country, but one of America's first entrepreneurs. Thank you. We, Jerry, so I got time for one question. If you guys want to ask a little the time for questions, ask, ask them. Oh. I, I, I have a question, which is, uh, how hard was it to, within your communities to build a consensus around the sector to focus on, whether it be water or fintech or food or, or what have you? Was it, was it relatively easy or there actually was kind of a, it was pretty tough? I'll take a stab at it from Cincinnati. Um, it's still, we're, we're still working at it. Um, you know, we have every right to win at water, but they've been in pockets and in isolations. So uh, this is going to be uh, an excuse for us to get off of that side and get working and make people work together. So it's still a work in progress as far as we're concerned. And in Minneapolis, um, the hard part was, it was that there were a lot of individual groups doing things on their own to support the food community, but the hard part was just getting everyone on the same page. Sure. So I, I think in Milwaukee it was very simple. Um, the three that we're focused on are inextricably linked. I mean, you can't separate that. Thirty-four percent of uh, California's energy use goes to move water from one place to another. I mean, it's it, so yeah, it just makes a lot of sense. And you know, we really like the pipeline for fintech in our community. We really like it a lot. We like the geographic location, knowing that Delaware is a river away from us. So there's a lot of financial services providers and infrastructure there. But when you take a look at the fact that healthcare costs are a huge problem. It's not just finding new therapies and new solutions and new digital technologies. Managing the cost of healthcare is a serious problem. And that's probably one of the undercover bents about our FinTech focus that we really expect to see good things out of. Great, thanks. Well, let's give this group, first group, a big hand. So our, our feedback givers are gonna sit down um, and we're gonna move on to the second group and then we'll have a bit of a break after. So. Uh, Keep momentum high, keep your standing ovation strong. Um, the next group, the next P is place. One of the things that Henry Kissinger once said about the European Union was it's gonna be really hard to make it work because when I pick up the phone and call Europe, I don't really know who I call. And 
when cities have um don't really have a front door for startups like a physical place that when i want to start a company like where do i literally go um it's very very difficult and each of the, i mean everybody is doing some version of the four p's that we talked about but these groups have really stood out in developing interesting places for entrepreneurs um one of the oldest and most preeminent places for entrepreneurs in the country is in Nashville, which was one of the first Rise of the Rest tour stops. Um, and let's give Heather a big standing ovation. Here we go. Thank you. I'm Heather McBee of the Nashville Entrepreneur Center, and we're... Dr what? It's, it's on. It's on. All right, so I'm going to do that over real quick. I'm Heather McBee of the Nashville Entrepreneur Center, and we're driving healthcare innovation through entrepreneurial tech startups. Our value is our ecosystem. In 2015 alone, we screened almost 1,000 ideas and concepts. We connected 26 million in capital, and we've established a community of over 700 members being guided by coaches, over 250 coaches, and we've made connections to customers and end users. Our advantage is the ability to immerse these entrepreneurs in the healthcare service community in Nashville. We have over 400 companies in this space. It's a $40 billion industry of opportunity for us. We mitigate our entrepreneurs' challenges by connecting them to tech talent, consumer insights, and guiding them to gain more investment capital. We do this through Project Healthcare. And Project Healthcare is the Nashville Entrepreneur Center's year-round initiative to drive healthcare, on, healthcare transformation in tech-enabled, patient-focused services around Wow, this has been a long day. <laughs> it's around preventative care, self-maintenance, and clinical services. We're connecting our community, we're connecting our entrepreneurs to the community coaches and curriculum that they need to be successful. Our, connect, our community is made up of two speaker series and unconference. Our coaches are not just mentors, they're also industry experts and service providers. And our curriculum is for idea stage companies, it's for a, an immersion, and it's for accelerator stage companies. Before now, we were focused on community engagement using third parties. The change and what we're focused on to change the tide are internally operated, economic-driven verticals for all stages of companies. The Nashville Entrepreneur Center's passion is the community and our commitment to the community. We're taking the, you're making me nervous, that's what it is. <laughs> We're attacking the wealth gap head on, simply by teaching the entrepreneurial mindset to those in the community who want to create, launch, and grow their own enterprises. We're looking for health tech-minded entrepreneurs that are coachable, resilient goal setters that want to drive transformation with us. And our goals with the VILCAP relationship is simply to engage the global community and share best practices throughout the network while democratizing fundraising. Our goal long term is to be globally recognized for a community that celebrates our exits and drives and evolves our investment community. I hope Jared's not watching this. <laughs> Long term, though, we want to keep working to share best practices and reach a global community to find the best entrepreneurs for our programs. We're led by our CEO, Stuart McWhorter, and guided by an advisory board of industry leaders that is led by serial healthcare entrepreneur, Michael Burcham. My name is Heather McBee. We are Nashville. Normally, I give a much better presentation. <laughs>
fighting and some cities are noticeably fighting harder than others to, to come back and buffalo really stood out as one of these and one of the things that they're really placing big bets on is health around the buffalo niagara medical campus um and marnie and launch new york do much more than that but tell us about what you're doing in buffalo let's give marnie a big standing ovation round of applause <laughs> Thanks so much, Ross. Yes, Buffalo is finally shedding its Rust Belt reputation through innovations, first in healthcare and next energy solutions. We are building on a long history of inventions, the implantable pacemaker, now diagnostics from the Human Genome Project, and the first drug company spawned from UB-based technologies treating cancer and slated to create over 1,000 jobs. That's among all these established companies more than 1,100 strong, plus multiple health systems. This entire pipeline of innovation is fueled by 50 colleges and universities, more than a billion dollars a year in research and development, and signature facilities such as the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus. Many of you don't know, it's home to the first comprehensive cancer care center in this country, as well as an internationally recognized life sciences incubator, and now the Vilcap Communities Program. Sorry. But innovation abounds, challenges await. All of our new entrepreneurs each year realize that we lack the seasoned entrepreneurial talent, the industry connections we've talked about, as well as seed capital. Not surprisingly, 3% of venture capital invested in New York State annually comes to our region. That's it. So what have we done about that? We have created hands-on mentoring services at the local level paired with a national mentor network, 1,800 strong through the Innovation Center of the Rockies, plus seed capital and a really strong ecosystem. We built this on decades of doing intensive mentoring for traditional businesses, but we knew we had to create tailored programs for high growth as well as biomedical companies. One-on-one -on -one mentoring, boot camps, venture forums, as well as an award-winning incubator, and 10 million in seed capital that has already yielded 60 to one return in economic impact. What motivated us? Our own experience doing life sciences startups, but we and the rest of the country have been on fire since the Coffin Foundation re released these results showing the impact of startups on job creation. Our startup experience also showed us the power of traveling with a team. Vilcap Communities gives us that. Soulmates who get it, share best practices, foster connections, sharing so we can all grow and benefit. Our first program will run in late summer, Health and Life Sciences, a very diverse group of sectors. These will all be entrepreneurs who are motivated as well as pre-revenue or early revenue. We work with an entire ecosystem who will coordinate with our core Thanks for the partners who are here from University of Buffalo, Launch New York, and Invest Buffalo Niagara. We know that the VILCAP Communities platform will help us achieve our goal of investment-ready startups through peer selection model, as well as connections to relevant resources, particularly smart money. It's all about wins and exits. We know that we have to create a sustainable ecosystem where we are truly transforming our economy and empowering every citizen to participate in our renaissance. Our team, we're entrepreneurs working to help entrepreneurs, and we were truly humbled and honored to be part of this amazing group of VILCAP communities. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Marnie, that was great. Uh, now you heard from Steve a little bit about New Orleans and uh, the way that entrepreneurs have really rebuilt the city. and. A lot of people move to New Orleans wanting to get involved in impact investing or something like that. And Propeller has really created a front door for a community that's rebuilding itself from the ground up. So let's give Julia a big standing ovation. Uh, keep the momentum up and hear about Propeller. Hello, oh, all right. Hi everybody, my name is Julia Stewart. I am the director of programs for Propeller. I started out as an intern with that organization um, back in 2012, was their first hire. Um, so for better or worse, I've been with them ever since. I'm also a big fan of Ellen DeGeneres, 
And she once said, uh, why aren't entrepreneurs making something that are, that's more worthwhile, like tortilla chips that can withstand the weight of guacamole? <laughs> I question that myself. But we at Propeller really do feel as though we're doing something that's worthwhile. We are trying to build a critical mass of entrepreneurs that are tackling challenges within four sectors of health, food, education, and water in order to really move the needle for underserved populations. In New Orleans, entrepreneurial activity is booming. In fact, it's actually 56% above the national average. Forbes called us the fastest growing city in America. What's a better source than Forbes is Steve Case himself, who said that the city is poised to reemerge as one of the great startup cities in the country, maybe even the world. And yet, no one's shown us the money. If you look at Birmingham, a city of comparable size, they actually received seven times the number of small business loans than New Orleans. In 2014, we only received $120 million in equity investment, and the majority of that went to a few large deals. To drive social, environmental, and economic impact for New Orleans, we have very specific strategies and very specific metrics that, we're, that we have to track progress. Sometimes what that looks like is entrepreneurs come to us with solutions that are actually already addressing those strategies. Sometimes we have to go out and actually recruit them. And sometimes, as Steve was talking earlier, we partner with existing organizations to leverage their infrastructure and get them to pursue these strategies uh, from the inside out. Since 2009, we've supported 90 ventures. Collectively, they've generated $60 million and created 250 jobs. We also have about 200 individuals and organizations that work out of our 10,000 square foot co-working space. We're trying to address some pretty big challenges and they're, they're complex issues within food, health, education, and water. And we need all hands on deck. So something that Propeller does is we help to align and create collaborations between top-down policymakers and influencers and these grassroots innovators to really make, make change happen faster. We're excited for this new partnership. Oh. You all knew that I was not on. <laughs> but no one, no one told me at all. Thank you. Well, regardless, regardless, that's fine. Um, we're excited for this new partnership with Village Capital and the New Orleans Startup Fund. It's the first time that we're offering equity investment in our programming. Uh, our, at the core of our programming, we run a three-month boot camp for growth stage companies. And we just kicked off this past Saturday, yes. Uh, felt like finals week. The 16 participating companies, both for-profit and non-profit, are really poised for growth. They're looking to double and triple their revenues in 2016. La la la, partnerships uh, make things happen. What's next? <laughs> We're actively achieving a critical mass of entrepreneurs. Um, uh, la la la, I'm already gonna get the boot. Um, <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, so we better be careful when we talk about California because Fresno is not really seeing a lot yet of what has happened in Silicon Valley, just like Buffalo is not seeing a lot yet of what's happening in New York City. But most of the country's food is grown in inland California. Huge opportunity for entrepreneurs. Irene, tell us what's going on in Fresno at the Wet Center. Last standing ovation before wine and beer come out. Keep morale high. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for the warm welcome. My name is Irene Shea, and I'm here representing the Wet Center. Um, and I'm here to welcome you to Fresno, a taste of Fresno. Now, before we come to this matter, you're probably wondering, where is Fresno? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Um, where it is, it's in California. It is in the central part of California, and it's in the dead center of uh, central California in the city called Fresno, which is the fifth largest city in California. And it's equidistant between San Francisco and Los Angeles. Now, a little bit, a few tidbits about the Central Valley and specifically the county of Fresno. Basically, Fresno, rep the Central Valley represents about 40% of the food consumed in the United States. But with a lot of agriculture comes a lot of water. And with a lot of water comes a lot of energy to supply the water to the agricultural centers. 
So it probably won't surprise you that our expertise is actually ag tech, water, as well as energy. And so those are the problems that entrepreneurs love to solve. But on the flip side, what is the biggest problem that the entrepreneurs face? It's the expectation gap between investors and founders. Now, our community is just like a lot of communities where we're really short on seed capital. We're really scraping around to get that kind of funding. But I actually think it's more of a gap between expectations because with the founder, interesting about the agricultural community is the farmer mentality is very much about keeping your head down and working hard. So a lot of people actually don't want equity. They don't understand the purpose of it. They think it's evil, they don't know what to do with it, or they maybe ask too little because they're afraid of asking too much. So what they need to understand is how capital can scale. And then they need to understand the other things that entrepreneurs often don't understand um, until they go through it. On the other side, the investors need to understand that high returns equal high risk because there are a lot of successful business people that want to invest, but oftentimes it can lead to a disaster if they don't realize that the way they made their money is not necessarily the way they're gonna make it when they invest. The competitive advantage, what do we do better? Well, when it comes to the wet, the water, energy, and ag tech, we're the best in the um, uh, creating an innovative ecosystem for wet industries. So we have suppliers, we have research labs. Basically, we have a network to all of the key players um, that are needed to help the startups really take off. Our core value proposition is we want to accelerate the commercialization of wet technologies. We want to help the entrepreneurs develop, and we have specific resources that can help them. We have a 1,000-acre living lab. We have state-of-the-art hydraulic labs, plug-and-play workspaces, and some of the other typical things that entrepreneurs have. Um, we test, we commercialize, and we help the startups. So what have we accomplished to date? Well, the WET Center was established in 2007. These are some of the accomplishments of the WET Lab. The WET Incubator was established in 2011, and our next project is the WET Accelerator. And it was just an honor to be um, accepted into the VILCAP community because we want to, I see we're almost done. Okay, so because we want to be able to use the resources of the VILCAP communities to launch our accelerator. Thank you so much. That was great. So we can, thank you, Irene, that was great. So if we can ask Irene and the other communities to go there, have our feedback givers come here. I'm gonna pivot this a little bit because I thought the Q&A at the end was pretty interesting. So I might ask each of you to make a comment and then direct a question at one or two of the communities so we can hear from each of you like once and each of them once, does that make sense? Comment and a question, simplified. Sure. Okay. Um... Great job to all of you. Um, I was um, thinking about some of our work. It's hard for me not to think about some of our work at the foundation when I'm hearing all of you. And we have talked to hundreds, thousands of entrepreneurs over the years and looked at the literature. And really, it comes down to entrepreneurs needing um, help with money matters, with their market, customer development, and with their management, people problems. And I love how each of you are tackling you know, that kind of personalized education for the entrepreneurs you're working with in, in different ways. Um, I love, um, you know, especially in Nashville, your, your approach, very customized personal education for the entrepreneurs. In Buffalo, I love the regional approach, and that's very smart, the broad, a broad region you're covering. Um, New Orleans, I'll just say that it's um, so ripe for entrepreneurial activity, and we've been at the foundation have adopted a lot of our education innovation from what we're seeing happening in New Orleans, it's a real hotbed for education entrepreneurship. Um, you know, in um, you know, in Fresno, your approach, you're so right on about um, educating um, entrepreneurs about the need for capital, how, how and what and when, that's, that's really important. And finally, um, I, this struck me something that um, you said about Buffalo, which I have been talking with others about today, is that you want to empower every citizen in your community to be part of this renaissance. And I think that's a good reminder of why we're doing this. You know, we do entrepreneurship to make life better for, for lots of people. So all in there. Uh, again, I was very uh, impressed with this group and, and uh, can relate with the slide uh, <laughs> sinking that can... Yeah, yeah, Not, nice recovery there. <laughs> um, 
I, I really felt like um, the uh, the Nashville and and the Buffalo um, uh, organizations had probably a little more focused uh, approach in terms of of, of the um, the sector that they were uh, addressing. I mean, that's not necessarily uh, you know good or bad. It's just uh, uh, you know when you are working on some, uh, you know, multiple of sectors, it can be a little more challenging in terms of being able to provide uh, the, the depth of resources for the different uh, entrepreneurs. Um, and so that's something that obviously you, you should probably look at. Um, I thought the um, Nashville um, presentation, uh, I, I really liked uh, the, the community coaches and curriculum and um, felt like um, you know that really is uh, a big part of creating the kind of support that uh, you know entrepreneurs are going to really need. Um, I was impressed with the track records uh, of, of the healthcare industry and the partnerships uh, in Buffalo. Uh, you know, I mean, what a what a great community to have those uh, major corporations and to be able to get them involved and engaged. I mean, uh, those partnerships are just really uh, critical. Uh, also impressed with New Orleans in terms of, I mean, you're you're almost working with uh, a, a starting slate there because of, you know, everything that's gone on there. And uh, uh, and I can I can understand the challenge when you have the capital shortage that that you mentioned. You know, very little going to startups and and not very much. I mean, that's that's obviously something that. That I think uh, you, you're, you're, you've got to work on, um, and you know I think Fresno really is an, a very interesting uh, location, and and probably has a very unique opportunity, particularly uh, you know in the wet uh, uh, tech you know areas that you focused on, and um, it was interesting for you, uh, in for at least for me to understand the the challenge that you had. In kind of educating and and syncing the expectations between entrepreneurs and investors, and quite often, you know, that is really a big challenge that you face, uh, you know, in in, in this space. Uh, but you know, by and large, just very impressed with all what what you're doing, and and wish you great success. Uh, and I think I think Ross, your grouping of these based on the idea of place, I think made a lot of sense. It was interesting to see in each of their stories sort of what the history of that particular city, that region was, and why that informed where they should focus, and, and particularly in the case of, of Fresno, reminding us where Fresno was was helpful, and reminding us that 40% of our food comes from, you know, that you know, Central Valley, I think, is, is, is uh, in, instructive. And I also give you credit for the clever branding of a water-related innovation uh, zone, the wet you know, kind of tech kind of thing. That was quite clever. And, and similarly, obviously, I've seen a lot of great things in the other cities. We've been on this Rise the Rest tour in Buffalo and, and New Orleans and, and Nashville, and the things that are happening there are, are, are remarkable. I guess my question, getting back to the question you know, side of things, but it would be on the, on the Fresno side. Given how close you are to Silicon Valley, is, are there partnerships now forming, or is Silicon Valley kind of doing its own thing and kind of ignoring all the history and learnings in Fresno. Oh, no. I think oh. I can answer it quickly, and then we got to go to the break. Oh, okay. Yes. I thought I was supposed to ask a question. Yeah. The comments were so thoughtful that the question time is out. <laughs> the uh, California state and worldwide. So for sure, and in fact, a lot of Silicon Valley actually come to us because we have the labs and we have the testing facilities and we have the customers that they're trying to find. So for sure, yeah. Great, thanks a lot. So I would love to, uh, before you all get applause, we're gonna do a little bit of moving. I'd love to have our communities and our feedback givers back there. If you are not a community or feedback giver, the bar is open and you can have beer and wine back there if you are. There's, there's a little bar back there. So um, We'll be back in 15 minutes, so get a drink. If you're upstairs, come downstairs. This is keep gonna, the fun's gonna keep going. Let's go.
All right. Five-ish minutes warning. If you've got a drink, I would ask that you come and sit as far forward as you can. Um, if you don't yet have one, get one in the next few minutes and come take a seat. But the fun's going to continue in a little bit. Okay. All right. Let's all take a seat. If you've got a seat in the back, I'd ask that you take it in the front. Uh, we're going to keep the momentum high, and we're going to get started in about two more minutes.
great. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, clap three times. If you can hear me, clap four times. If you can hear me, clap five times. All right. Uh, the enthusiasm is good. Some people from the last wave have receded, like the startups that are going to fail in the third wave. Um, we have some new people who have come in right as the bar opens. The, the third wave includes beer and wine, so maybe the third wave is a little more fun than the first two. Uh, that's great. So um, what we're going to do is move on to the next group. And this is a group that is really focusing on the third P, which is people. I think a huge focus of what is not working in entrepreneurship in the US is the kind of people who have access to resources. Um, like Steve Case, I also have nothing against white guys. Um, and like Steve Case, I also am a white guy. But most of the people who raise venture funding look like me. And most of the problems in the US are disproportionately experienced by people who do not look like me. And we are not going to get entrepreneurs working on solving these important problems until we, we change who's at the table. And so a lot of the great work we're seeing in entrepreneurship across America is focused on exactly that, changing who's starting companies, gets access to resources, what's, uh, what's going to happen. And so starting, we're going to start with Chicago. And 1871 has been a great entrepreneurial leading organization for a while. Um, but spinning out of that is a group trying to change this 5% of women getting venture funding. So we're going to make Chicago the best city for women founders in the country. Let's give a big standing ovation to Wisdom. I think, I think I got it. OK, is this thing on? OK, awesome. So hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Williams from Chicago. Yay. And I'm the co-facilitator of Wisdom, um, our program for women entrepreneurs. To tell you just a little bit about 1871, we are a, a tech hub focused on helping startups start. We create a community where everything that's possibly needed to start a business is there, including venture funds, incub other incubator programs, other university programs. We've been able to create 4,000 jobs just in the past few years that we've been in operation. So, but we also want to help um, women and other diverse, um, other diverse groups. So we decided we wanted to create a women-focused program, but we wanted to get more information about what that would take. So we went to the women, and we asked them, if we create a women-focused program, what do you need? And this is what they said they needed. They needed access to capital. They needed access to technology resources and talent. They needed a community to support them and help them. So we created Wisdom. And Wisdom helps, and it's a 16-week program that's focused around th these three areas. We create educational opportunities around financing. Pitch training is a huge part of our curriculum. Um, we, we connect them to our already existing connections to venture capitalists. Um, we already have a diverse community of women entrepreneurs and leaders. We foster those opportunities and connections. And we help them with mentorship and educational opportunities around technology, as well as helping them hire technical talent. Here are some of our partners. Um, these are not only financial supporters for us. For example, Google for Entrepreneurs, we're part of their 40 Forward initiative. But they also help our program, and they are mentors and participants in our program and help our women succeed as well. This is the team, myself, along with Nicole Yeary, who is my fellow co-facilitator. She's the founder of Miss Tech and a highly regarded woman in the tech community. Um, and myself, I am, have a networking and wireless background, but I can bring the operation experience as well as the passion for being a woman in tech and business to the program. We're supported by the 1871 staff and community, as well as the Miss Tech staff and the, the larger community as well. And we're supported by our board, which is represented by all of these companies mentioned here. So far, we've had one successful cohort. It went really, really well. One of our companies was able to raise over a million dollars in funding. Yeah. Um, 
We've had some of our companies go on to other incubator accelerator programs like Y Combinator, for example, or Impact Engine. We've even helped one hire, hire their CTO through our recruiting program. So we are very happy with what we've done so far to date. And in addition to the 400 members of the 1871 community, we create programming and events and resources for the other 2,500 women that are in the Chicago community. Um, one, one last second. Um, <laughs> sorry. So we're really happy to be part of the VILCAP community. We are very excited about implementing the peer review model in our program, and we're really happy to be here and, and be a part of it. we're happy. You're happy. Thank you so much. <laughs> Great work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thanks a lot. That was great. So up next, uh, Washington, D.C., where uh, I live in the D.C. area, has the highest median income of people of color of any city in the country, thriving black middle class, great legacy of the city. Um, one of the lowest rates of startup investments in people of color, but there is a way to change that and Jason's gonna tell you how. Absolutely. How's everyone feeling? Ovation. All right. Yeah, we're still doing the standing right. ovation after the, the... Cool, cool. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Am I clear? Good. So, welcome everyone. I'm here to tell you a little bit about Groundwork VC and what we're doing uh, in DC and in innovation communities around the country. Uh, leveling the playing field by investing in domestic emerging markets. What are domestic emerging markets? People of color, women, uh, LGBTQ founders, uh, folks who are building companies, folks who are building companies uh, in communities that are either underrepresented in the tech uh, landscape, underinvested in, uh, we're looking to play a major role in that. Why? And what problems are, uh, are these entrepreneurs uh, best suited to solve? Uh, so absolutely designing commerce uh, for over-indexed consumers. So how do we build products that meet the needs of today's changing demographic uh, if we're not supporting, investing in, and uh, realizing the talent that exists in these communities? Uh, limited access to healthy lifestyles. Uh, Unequal education is a big one, and one of the biggest things that we're really looking to do with what we're building with Groundwork is uh, building out the ecosystem for training and investment that builds inclusion into the DNA of what we're, uh, of what we're launching. So it's not something where we're gonna you know, pull a, a diversity program into this. We're actually building this into the, into the infrastructure early on. So, who do we want to be working with and uh, what gives us a competitive advantage? Uh, a, we're building out a online platform as well as a uh, accelerator program that will exist in Washington, D.C. We're partnering with the mayor's office and Luma Lab. We're building out the inclusive innovation incubator uh, in D.C. Uh, and I'm really excited about that. But we're Pause. <laughs> uh, we're really excited about that. But um, also, aside from, aside from that piece, we're also building out programming uh, through an online, through online uh, portal that's going to allow us to reach not only the entrepreneurs that are in D.C. that are going through our accelerator, but also uh, to reach broader, a broader audience. And uh, these are some of the relationships and folks that we've been working with and folks that we're looking to work with. Uh, and so, again, the highly networked piece, uh, I spent a lot of time, probably about 40% of my time, in the Valley, one of the things that I do uh, in the Valley is build the connection and build the bridge between entrepreneurs uh, of color, women, again, and LGBTQ founders, uh, building the bridge to the resources that exist uh, in that ecosystem as well. So what are the biggest problems uh, that entrepreneurs face in these communities? So really quickly, over the last year and a half, I've talked to, advised, uh, invested directly in or just had conversations with over 350 founders uh, of color and founders from these groups. And these are the things that we've really pulled out of where the needs are. Absolutely institutional access. A lot of our founders are just locked out um, and locked out of the opportunity, locked out of the power networks that you need, uh, locked out, period. Progressive exposure. There's some many, many, many folks doing amazing things across the country, but no one knows about it. They don't have the resources to get that word out, to spread that word. And if you don't rise above 
uh, the, the fray, you're going to have a hard time really talking to and, uh, and getting the investment community to jump on board. And then, again, we get back to access to capital. Uh, really quickly, uh, there's just a lack of the early, early, <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's a really lack of their early, early capital. So the friends and family round that does not exist in our communities, we're looking to be first money in. We're looking to build wraparound services around our entrepreneurs as well. Uh, and I'm really going to be quick here. And we're excited <laughs> for you to solve it. Let's give Jason a big hand. Man. Great work. Thank you. All right. So up next, um, we've got from... Hawaii. There are those who say people from Hawaii are never going to amount to anything. Um, and they are heavily underrepresented. <laughs> President Obama, Steve Case, a bunch of losers over time, but um, underrepresented in uh, entrepreneurship. But when you've got a small group of people that are able to partner together, uh, you can build really great things. So coming out of Hawaii, we have Tarek and Sultan Ventures bringing together a really great partnership. Let's give a big standing ovation for the great people from the great state of Hawaii. I do, I do need the clicker, though. Ross, clicker. <laughs> All right, can everyone, everyone hear me okay? Aloha. Uh, <laughs> so my name's Tarek Sultan. I'm here to talk today about the Hawaii United Innovators. A uh, little bit of background about um, our firm. Uh, long story short, we are crazy stupid passionate about all things startups. Um, what I do want to focus on, on this slide is the education piece. And the reason for that is that edu we believe that education uh, needs to uh, disseminate into everything that we do. And part of that reason is we live by two phrases, two mantras, right? A rising uh, tide raises all ships and uh, takes a village, right? And so imagine our surprise when we came across the village capital model, the rise of the rest model. I mean, it's exactly what we live and breathe. So we were very excited to, take a, to, to collaborate with village capital. These slides are all jacked up, doesn't matter. Um, so a little background about Hawaii. Um, so what is Hawaii known for other than the miserable weather and the terrible people? Um, <laughs> it's known for tourism and military and defense primarily, and then a, a few other things. It's starting to get known for ag and energy. What is it um, lacking, though? Everything. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. <laughs> it. It is a grind out there. Um, we have limited resources, limited capital, lim limited land, limited talent. That's not to say people there aren't talented. They are. It's just that we don't have that critical mass that a lot of other cities have. You know, Salt Lake City, you heard the mayor say we have about 1.1 million people here. In Hawaii, we have that same amount uh, dispersed across the islands in the most isolated population mass in the world. And so it's, it's, it's pretty tough out there. But they always say entrepreneurship and innovation thrives in areas of limited resources. And that we have in spades. So. <laughs> So how do we actually capitalize on that? I came up with a really geeky f word called reficiency. That's going to be the theme of the next two minutes, one minute, one minute. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I'll just jump right to the agriculture, energy, and investment side of that. What does it look like? Why are we focusing on agriculture? If there was a catastrophic, catastrophic event, we wouldn't be able to survive more than a week in Hawaii. So we need to come up with innovation that, that mitigates crop loss, that promotes, uh, that maximizes our our oceans, right? What are one of the few resources that we do have? And energy, it's pretty self explanatory what reficiency means, right? Uh, we are paying three to four times the national average. Now, take your energy bill and multiply that by three and a half times four, right? That's unbelievable. Now, that's the price of paradise, right? <laughs> so, uh, team and partners, I have 25 seconds left. Uh, really excited about this collaboration. It's called the HUI. Um, in, in Hawaii, HUI means uh, team up or collaborate. And so it's with Saltometers Energy Accelerator. So Jill's here. Accelerate UH. I'm, I'm also Accelerate UH. Um, Maui Food Innovation Center. Exciting partnership. Why are we the team to do it? We're awesome. Um, <laughs> we're awesome. We're awesome. Thank you, Julie and Craig. Um, Energy Accelerator is unbelievably awesome. And in terms of investment reefficiency, what that means is. Uh, <laughs> What that means is actually you don't get more time by running way. away. Along, <laughs> I had a ridiculous amount of slides. I knew this was going to happen. All right. Well, great work, Hawaii. <laughs>
So go over there. Actually, you do, you do go over there because you guys are going over there. We're going to have our feedback givers come up for this round. Um, we've got three, and the P's are not evenly distributed. Um, just like in venture capital, um, the P's are not evenly distributed around the country. So maybe next year we'll have evenly distributed P's. So come on, come on up. That was like a, a like three levels deep joke that didn't go very well. Right. Reinvent VC hashtag. I thought this is this on. Okay. I thought this was a very uh, interesting and and diverse group. Probably the most diverse that we've had. Um, uh, and I'm really glad to see uh, uh, one of the ones here focused on uh, a gender lens. And uh, <clears throat> I think the uh, the wis wisdom wisdom uh, concept uh, is uh, is going to be really important in terms of, of, of making this happen. The, the community, the capital, and and technology. Um, I think the um, the advice that I would give is to really focus on the barriers that that uh, women face that that may not necessarily be what men face in terms of you know the expectations and um, the approach to entrepreneurship and and actually uh, you know working with investors and and uh, you know my my experience is that. Uh, women are every bit as capable. In fact, the investments that we've invested in, 46% of them are in, in women-led uh, organizations. Um, because because we, we, we focus on, on really the, 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 the business fundamentals as opposed to, um, you know, the gender, so to speak. And, and, and I think if you, can, if you can get women to have that kind of confidence going in, um, that uh, you'll go a long way in in building greater success with with women-led uh, enterprises. I thought the the DC um, uh, just a little. Um, I, I I suppose just for me, I needed to understand a little bit more on the focus on that um, and what the value proposition was and how the online model worked. Hawaii, I think, the unique opportunity. I mean, the the natural resources. Uh, are limited there, and I think really focusing on on the problems is is really really uh, what you need to do. Okay. So uh, Jessica, um, I thought it was great that you asked you know women entrepreneurs what they needed. I would have liked to have seen some data to back that up, so I'd encourage you to make sure you're tracking your data and your outcomes. Um, I thought the focus on the three C's was, was really important, and I guess my challenge to you would be that I'm seeing like um, other uh, groups here serve, you know, focusing on women, uh, women entrepreneurs, so you know, spreading that and learning from other communities and vice versa is going to be really important. Uh, Jason, I wish I could have seen the rest of your presentation because I, I wasn't quite sure what the, the model was, but I liked the fact that you identified these unique opportunities for the entrepreneurs that you're going to serve that are like under-addressed or undressed market needs and products and services. I thought that was really interesting. And I like that you're partnering with Code 2040. We were pleased to support them um, back in the day. And then in Hawaii, again, I think this is, I've seen like four, um, or we'll see four of these communities focusing on water and ag and energy. And so I'd encourage you to, um, you know, look across those other communities, see what you can learn. And I thought it was interesting that um, you're focusing on this not just because it's a luxury, but it's a necessity for, for your state. And I think that's important. And uh, very wise that entrepreneurship does thrive within constraints and um, limited resources. I have no doubt that you'll succeed. In, and nice use of the word awesome, by the way. So, all right. <laughs> uh, just a couple, couple things to add. Uh, first of all, these are three great cities and with great opportunities. And, and uh, living in D.C. and having grown up in Hawaii and been to you know, Chicago many times, I think the, the focus you've got and the momentum you have is really quite 
uh, encouraging, and particularly in, in the case of uh, Chicago and D.C., the focus on more inclusion, because they are kind of diverse cities, and a lot of people do feel kind of left out, uh, is critically important. So I uh, applaud that. And, and obviously on the, on the Hawaii side, I, I talked about the third wave earlier and how I borrowed the title from Alvin Toffler, but also was sort of inspired by growing up in Hawaii and surfing. So I, I give credit to Hawaii, for, uh, Hawaii for, th for that. And the point you made, which is, which is, it was true 20 years ago, can't, it cannot be allowed to be true 20 years from now that 90% of food is imported. Uh, is, is, it's crazy, and I'm, I'm glad you're focused on, on that because it's a big problem to, uh, to solve, both in terms of supporting all the land that, that uh, has been used for agriculture, for pineapple and sugar that's now you know, mostly growing weeds. How do we redeploy that either for energy or, or food? So I'm glad that's uh, your, your focus. All right. Thanks a lot. All right, so we are coming down the home stretch. Uh, thank you, I appreciate you giving the final wave of folks the same enthusiasm that you gave to folks at the beginning, because we have a few more great American cities to hear from. Coming out first, um, we've seen, it's obvious that a lot of people eat a lot of food, and there are a lot of food opportunities. Um, coming from Honolulu, Hawaii to Portland, Maine, that was a lot better than the Baltimore to Philadelphia thing. Um, we have Maine Accelerates Growth. Let's give them a big standing ovation. And this P is purpose. So all of these have a specific impact objective with a specific sector theme. Terrific. Well, hi, I'm Martha Bentley, and welcome to the Portland, Portland, Maine, and Maine Accelerates Growth. I'd like to give you a little bit of context about our town, Portland. We punch way above our weight class. To give it in context, 98% uh, of our private enterprises are small businesses. We have 1.3 million people, over 30,000 square miles, and yet we have an amazing and vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem. Maine Accelerates Growth has three core pro uh, purposes, the growth of companies, communities, and talent by funding, creating, and leveraging um, high-impact programs and events, and we do this in a complementary network. We're building on three years of work as Blackstone Accelerates Growth with three statewide partners working in five innovation hubs, with Portland being the anchor hub. But now we're transitioning in 2016 to Maine Accelerates Growth, taking charge of our own destiny and becoming a partner in the village capital community to leverage our entrepreneurial community for high-impact food. We've moved from three to 15 organizational partners who have bought into our uh, innovative design that is based largely on cooperation. So everyone competes to see who can be the most cooperative, and our best ideas are the ones that rise to the top. We're ready to move this concept into working in our food cluster, which has a vibrant support system, because we know that growing Maine's food industry is growing Maine. Maine's entrepreneurs in food and ag are absolutely amazing. They're working in everything from land-based aquaculture to building the supply chain for Maine's craft brewers to developing platforms for aggregating our wonderful food and getting it to markets outside of Maine. Our project is going to focus on entrepreneurs that have high aspirations, that are coachable and want to work with others, and that are leaders in their communities. We anticipate that their companies will be working in value-added products, they'll be looking for markets outside of Maine, and they'll be providing solutions for food entrepreneurs. Maine entrepreneurs have a lot of challenges, I will admit, and food entrepreneurs particularly have issues with scale, they don't know how to, um, issues with access to capital, and largely with getting outside markets outside of Maine. We're thrilled that, uh, that we are a uh, VILCAP community. It's a good housekeeping seal of approval for us, and it's an option to be part of uh, a bigger network. We also plan to use the peer selection model not only for our entrepreneurs, but also for our entrepreneurial programs to do a peer selection process for who we fund. We're also excited to be a leader in the traceable food movement. So what we want to do together with you is to weave an amazing network to help our entrepreneurs support each other. And our goal is to facilitate uh, 7 to 10 million into our entrepreneurial ecosystem and transform the main economy. 
We're doing this because we're inspired by Maine entrepreneurs, and our church has both a uh, preacher and a minister. And that and is together. an excellent segue. Thank right. you, Martha. So Martha also didn't know that she was pitching until very recently, but the, she's the minister, the preacher, Jess Knox, who hosted us in Portland for Eyes of the Rest, and many of you know is actually adopting a baby today. So Martha was the last second. And the women always win Rise of the Rest, so like maybe my job security is not good right now. Um, so up next, our, our next P purpose is, is education. And cities across the country are doing lots to reinvent education, but Kansas City has been ahead of most. From Think Big, Carrie, tell us what's talking, what you're doing in Kansas City. A big standing ovation. Hello, hello. Uh, my name's Carrie Keefe. I work for Think Big Partners. I actually run the nonprofit foundation of this fantastic Innovation Center in downtown Kansas City, Missouri. You probably think Kansas City is in Kansas. It's not, it's in Missouri. <laughs> We've been a tech accelerator for about the last six years. Um, we have you know, 740 companies that we've helped. We've got a lot of um, startups and patents and great things that we have been able to um, evolve and, and take part in. Uh, but we are basically 21,000 square feet of a co-working space. We are a tech accelerator and an innovation center for the entrepreneurial um, ecosystem in Kansas City. Um, we are also the innovation manager of the city's Smart and Connected Communities Initiative with Cisco. This is a 2.2 mile stretch of new streetcar line in our downtown, which is an amazing sensor-based data collecting, awesome, innovative opportunity for um, innovation and smart city application development. So what's a tech accelerator doing in the space of education? Well, we have mashed up with the Lean Lab, an education incubator in Kansas City that has a couple of cohorts and 15 odd you know, uh, ed startups under its belt. They regularly get thousands of people together um, to participate and attend their workshops. They are working with 4.0 schools nationally, and they are the exclusive provider of Startup Weekend um, education version. So we are incredibly excited to be able to bring a specific VILCAP education community to Kansas City. So education and innovation is complex, but specifically education and innovation is messy, it's social, and it takes a lot of effort. It's hard and it's important. But what it is more than anything, it's not a prescription and it's not a program, it's a shared vision. And it's this that really empowers us and emboldens us as a community. Everybody loves the baby. So education, why, why education? We have a particular opportunity in Kansas City based on the ecosystem of our Google Fiber. Anybody familiar with Google Fiber? We were picked by um, Google Fiber a couple years ago as its first installation. And pair that with our Cisco Smart Cities Initiative and we have a really, opportunity, really unique opportunity to create and leverage um, IoT and data in interesting ways that, we'll, that we want to really um, create the, the, the learners and the, the workforce of the future. Um, Kansas City geographically sits over two states, 19 counties, and 14 different school districts. Yeah, you heard me right, 14 different school districts. But most of those schools actually have gigabit technology, and we are surrounded by a wonderful and amazing, thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem. We are also a catalyst among catalysts. With the Kauffman Foundation and their Ed Innovation uh, Task Force, the Lean Lab and their work with 4.0 schools, LRNG's tech platform, and of course the Mozilla Gigabit Fund in Kansas City. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right on time. That was great. Okay, how many of you heard of Square? How many you know it was founded in St. Louis? There is a booming fintech community in St. Louis. Um, but you've seen Ferguson in the national headlines, and they're a really great group of people in St. Louis thinking about how to use fintech to be a little more inclusive. And talking about that is our friends at 630 who have the purpose of financial inclusion out of St. Louis. Let's give them a standing ovation, only a couple more. Let's go. It, it, it's hard for a fintech guy to come behind a minister, a preacher, and an educator. Well, I'll try my, try my best here. Uh, so who, who knows what, why, how 630 gets its name? 
Yeah, so it's the height of the St. Louis or the Gateway Arch. And so we sort of think about uh, 6.30 as the gateway access to the best and most promising fintech ideas from across the globe to the breadth and depth of uh, financial services in St. Louis. And as, uh, as Steve, you were talking about the past, his prologue and getting Shakespearean on us, uh, I sort of reset, reset the story a little bit to say, hey, at the turn of the previous century, St. Louis was the, first, the fourth largest city in the country. We had, sort of, we were in the middle of wealth and commerce, and we were the natural sort of hub for wealth and asset management and banking, right? And fast forward today, we have about 90,000 people in the financial and information space. Here, we are the third largest concentration of wealth advisors in the country. We are the fastest in terms of growth, in terms of employees and full-time workers in the financial and information services space. And this is, this is a dense chart because we've got density in financial services. Uh, and then here comes along, so this, is, so this is a massive asset for us. Just the depth of financial services is a massive asset for us. And the question is, how do we take this asset and make it an advantage? Right? And that's the question we have all for ourselves. And so here comes along financial technology, you know, girded by quick storage, open source, data, machine learning. And what FinTech fundamentally does is it makes room to serve the underserved markets, whether that's a small investor, it's a small saver, it's a, the underinsured, the 1099er, which is a big part of the market, are the farmers, right? I mean, really what you're doing is you're bending the cost curve that is otherwise hard to serve a smaller investor and in making financial services available. And if anybody has any doubt about it, look at what M-Pesa and Vodafone has done to Africa or what Alibaba has done to Chinese and small merchants and small buyers and wake up Financial Services USA, you know? And so you sort of look at this and say, this advantage that we have, this asset that we have, working together with the FinTech in startups, convert this asset into a real advantage, right? And we, our approach to getting advantage out of FinTech is fundamentally St. Louisian, right? We are the show me state. And so at a very simple level, revenue matters, right? We work with companies that have a working product, have market traction, and have some early revenues. And our role is to convert them from being product ready to be customer ready, and then to be capital ready, right? And uh, we have, uh, uh, the a lot the of wonderful going things on. going on in St. Louis. Great work. That was terrific. All right. Coming down to close, we got two left, and they've both got the same purpose, which is health, but they're attacking, they're attacking in different ways. Um, first, out of Austin, Texas, when we talk about rise of the rest, Austin is one of the cities that is, like here in Salt Lake, risen a little more than most, but in terms of venture funding, the dollars are not catching up to the people starting the companies. Um, but in Austin, they've got a great health community that is working to change that. Let's give the team from SoftMatch a big standing ovation as we close ourselves out. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Jackson. I'm the co-founder of SoftMatch. We're connecting enterprises with the global startup ecosystem. And having done that, we've gotten really good at making startups more accessible to investors and buyers. Now, I'm from Austin, Texas, and in Texas, we have a $49 billion healthcare headache. That is the estimated state of Texas expenditure on healthcare in 2016 alone. So we have this perfect storm happening in Texas right now. We have the number one fastest growing aging population in the country. We have four of the top 10 fastest growing cities in the country. And our demographic is shifting from 30% to 60%. Hispanic. So what that means is that we have a rapidly rising population with a high incident of chronic care issues. These are issues that make up 75% of our country's $3 trillion spending on health care. So in Austin, we realize that if we don't help solve this issue, our city and our state will just implode. Fortunately, our community really understands this so much that in 2012, the voters in Austin passed a bond proposal to build the Dell Medical School as part of the University of Texas. This is a really big deal because it's the first medical school uh, tied to a tier one research facility built in the country in the last 60 years. 
and its mission is to help figure out how to transition from a fee-for-service-based healthcare model to one based on value. And in Austin, we are uniquely positioned to help solve this issue. Uh, not only are we at the center of policy as the capital of Texas, but just last year, the Kauffman Foundation placed Austin as the number one city for startup activity. So our, our city is, is booming. Uh, our government institutions, our, our government institutions are engaging, our educational institutions are engaging, our voters are engaging, and our startup ecosystem is engaging. So we have a private public sector where interests are all coming together finally to really address this huge issue. Now, my team at SoftMatch is uh, lean and mean, small and mighty. We have a great roster of healthcare advisors, uh, healthcare partners that are leaders in their field. Uh, three managing directors. Uh, I manage our programs and research. Um, my man other managing director, Gordon Dougherty, and our co-founder, Melly Price, started cap helped start Capital Factory uh, in Austin, which is one of our country's leading tech accelerators. Um, Melly Price, our co-founder, who I hope you all will get a chance to meet, she's sitting right there, um, also sits on our Mayor's Social Innovation Council, tackling really big healthcare issues. And just recently, last week, was appointed uh, the, as the inaugural executive director of technology innovation at the new Dell Medical School. So collectively, uh, you know, in combination of our team, of the deep and meaningful relationships we have in the community, and by using the village capital peer selection investment model, we are well positioned to make a meaningful impact on driving down this country's enormous cost of healthcare. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was great. Thank you. So that was, that was really, really great. So we got one more. I want your best standing ovation of the day for the last, but certainly not least. There, actually, no one's the least, but you're not the one. Um, the, uh, the last, but certainly not least, we were talking about, uh, when Steve was talking about the third wave, there's an importance of startups trying to figure out how to partner with institutions. It's also equally important for institutions to partner with startups. And if a decade ago you said someone who works for John Hopkins reports directly to the president, we're here in Salt Lake pitching about why they want to do things in health with startups. People would think that was kind of weird. But Christy, you and Hopkins are the wave of the future. Give Christy a big standing ovation. Thank you. Only three minutes left. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much. Um, uh, a year ago, a little, uh, little less than a year ago, um, Baltimore made national headlines for our unrest. And the week of the unrest, the Wall Street Journal published an article about Pittsburgh and really the juggernaut, the technology juggernaut that Pittsburgh has become with Carnegie Mellon and Pitt and others as anchoring. And why did that happen? And um, uh, it did not go unnoticed that it said if only Johns Hopkins could commercialize more technology, Baltimore would be saved. I'm paraphrasing, but that's why I wake up in the, every morning to do this. So what assets do we have? We have some incredible core assets. Johns Hopkins um, is the number one institution for 35 years in a row, 2.2 billion in research spending coming out. We have over 2,500 active patents, over 500 disclosures last year, um, and in the region, some, some really incomparable assets, um, particularly for a highly regulated industry. So right in our backyard, the FDA, CMS, the largest payer in the country, um, Care First NIH, and of course our friends um, at Under Armour who are very focused on connective fitness and, and who are represented here today. So what is the future of healthcare? My friend Alec Ross recently published a book called Industries of the Future, and he described that the last trillion dollar industry was created based on zeros and ones, computer code. The next trillion dollar industry will be created based on the human genetic code and all of the things that come along with that. And so those that figure out how to use those tools um, will be the ones who innovate. And there are two major things happening in terms of um, new ways to measure and big data. And when you combine ways of measurement with big data, it will produce companies we've never seen, the likes we've never seen before. So what are we doing? We're trying to create a place for these startups to find a home and find resources. Um, and this is the most startling, this is what keeps me up at night. Companies created out of Johns Hopkins, so technology based on our intellectual property, raised over a billion dollars in capital just since 2010. But 
More than 90% of that capital left Baltimore. So it's not that our technologies can't get funded. It's not that we don't have great technology. It's just that they're going to the cities that are already getting funded. And imagine a world where Baltimore and the ecosystem there had these types of companies. And I'm proud to say that just today we signed a term sheet for our second venture-backed startup um, just in the last year with a $20 million A round. Um, uh, to be funded in Baltimore. So what are we, what needs are we facing the same as everyone else? Capital, particularly seed stage capital in the health technology area. Talent, I couldn't get away with not, uh, you know, one of our, uh, the Iron Horse, Cal Ripken, but, you know, talent is a big issue. And then lab space, just a, um, you know, a little bit of a joke there, but seriously, we, um, lab space is what we're trying to do. What have we done to address? We have space, resources, and funding, and we're trying to um, do our best. We're also very focused on social innovation um, and how we can take these technologies and bring them to the uh, developing countries and others who really need technology to leverage what they have. Um, we have got, we've got great partners in Baltimore, and I just want to say that um, this is really a new day for Baltimore. Um, Under Armour is committed to take 200 acres um, just uh, in the south part of the city and reinvent it, and this is our new home um, at the corner of Ashland and Wolf, um, where we will have 25,000 square feet of lab and office space for startups in Baltimore, and we're very proud that that will open later this year, so thank you. Christy, and I didn't even have to step on stage. It was like sticking the landing. That was good. Um, okay, let's invite our last group of people with a purpose. And as you see, like the, the four Ps, everyone can do the four Ps. All of these groups you see today have aspects, and if, if our feedback givers can come on up, all of our groups have aspects of people that they're bringing into the fold and places that are great and a purpose that is focused and partnerships that are great. So that the, the, the Ps were as much... Uh, organizing effect as, 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 as anything, but um, all of you did a really wonderful job. Um, we'd love to have a few comments from our panel. We'll go to questions if we have time, but if we don't, we will, we will declare victory on the day. Um, I don't know if you guys want to start? Well, uh, so we've seen 20, I think, in total? 16. It seemed like 20. <laughs> joking, joking. But 16 uh, cities, that uh, of which I think I've been to 14 of them in the last last couple of years. The other two I'll, I'll get to um, that really show the promise of this idea of the rise of the rest. I mean that to me is the the main thing. The the, the, the innovation happening in these cities around specific sectors is unbelievable. The passion that each of the presenters brings to trying to mobilize their community to get the networking going and get the you know get the different ways to you know shine a spotlight on what's happening is is amazing and it just it really is a reminder that what we're talking about in terms of regional entrepreneurship isn't a concept it's a reality it's just a reality that most people don't understand and as we focus more on you know the work of each of these cities uh, and what's happening in the network across all these cities that's really what's going to animate this to the this next level, Baltimore. Uh, you know, start with the last one. It is amazing what's what's happening there, and partly Christie's leadership, but also Hopkins and Under Armour and many of the others that are that are stepping up. And it really has an opportunity to reposition itself as a, an innovation city, uh, uh, which it already is. But that part of the story is not really uh, well told. Now, Kansas City has, uh, and, and you know, Wendy, because Kaufman is based there, can. Can, can speak to this and a great history and legacy of around innovation, including Kaufman himself, the, the area downtown where where Think Big, which by the way is a great name, Think Big, uh, is, is 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 innovating is extraordinary. Uh, St. Louis, very impressed with all the different things happening uh, there. It really is a, a magnet for uh, for talent and it, not just in fintech but also in in uh, ag tech and other kinds of things. It really is you know, well positioned. Uh, Portland is an unbelievable city. You know, millennials love it. It's a, you know, it's a foodie town. It's got a nice kind of you know, vibe to it. Uh, and now it's really stepping up in terms of uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, and, and finally, Austin. It, it sort of is, it's on the map. It is one of the ones that you know, thankfully has risen more. Uh, it was just, as I mentioned earlier, there for a few days this past uh, week, earlier this week, for the South By uh, conference. And you know, Austin still wants to stay weird while really emerging as one of the you know, greatest innovation cities in the country, indeed, in, in the world. So these are, we ended, ended strong with, with a bunch of great uh, presentations. Each of them individually is terrific, but I think if you take a step back and think about all 16 of these, the story that's being told really is the story of the next great wave of American entrepreneurship. And not to say, again, that things won't be, continue to be 
interesting in Silicon Valley or New York City or, or Boston. I'm sure they will be, but this is why uh, it's the, ri the rest is rising, and there's reason to be hopeful uh, for America and hopeful for entrepreneurship in America. Um, that was great, Steve. So um, I thought every one of you did a great job um, establishing the need, you know, and then the opportunity. So in um, Portland, again, you know, leveraging your unique strengths with food and ag, I guess I'm going to ask some rhetorical questions with, uh, with all of you, not to answer, but just to think about. But, you know, you said one of the challenges was getting um, the food entrepreneurs to have access to markets outside of Maine, and I would ask, you know, what would, how will you do that in what you're doing? Um, Kansas City, an unfair advantage, because I know, <laughs> I know about the great work of Think Big. Um, I think there's nothing more important right now than trying to innovate education in this country, and so um, I applaud what you're doing, the partners you're working with. Um, you know, um, St. Louis, uh, you know, terrific job of um, laying out the data and you have obviously you know, a huge density of financial companies. My rhetorical question would be, how will you tap that expertise to help the, the FinTech companies uh, that you're working with? And in Austin, again, you know, um, the one thing, you know, great demographic data established the need. Um, it's a great example of good timing. You know, the opportunity is, is upon you. Um, I wasn't quite sure what you did, though, with the entrepreneurs. You know, how, how do you, what's your model? And then in Baltimore, um, obviously a tremendous asset with John Hopkins, unbelievable. And uh, you did a, you packed a lot in that presentation and got to you know what the need was, what the opportunity was, and how you're going to address it. So good job. I think there needs to be a Simon Cowell on this panel. I mean, we're just all so easy on you guys. But I, I have to say, I, I was I was really impressed with uh, with this this group. Um, the thing I really liked was, you know, you really had a sector focus. You knew your markets and the assets. You were leveraging off of the assets in your community. We've learned that through the Village Capital Program, that those are the most successful programs. And so I, I think figuring that out um, is, is going to really help, you know, for impactful programs. Um, I think the other comment I'd make was, um, you know, the partnerships that you've developed, the cooperation, you know, across, uh, you know, the, the, the platforms and networks, even even potentially competing organizations, the fact of this co coopetition concept. You know, when you're when you're doing good, you can share and, and, and you know, you don't have the same, uh, you know, concern about uh, competition than, than you uh, might otherwise. Um, I think the um, uh, again the great uh, taking advantage like in in Baltimore and um, you know in in uh, Kansas City uh, well uh, particularly in St. Louis you know the banking industry that's there and really taking advantage and then and then really looking for an area where you can add value in terms of the impact financial inclusion and. What a great uh, opportunity to promote that. So uh, don't have a lot more uh, that I could say other than, you know, just keep up the good work. Well, I could just say one, one last thing before we hit the bar again, which I know everybody's eager, eager to do. Uh, I just want to thank a few people. First of all, you know, Jim for, for hosting us here and Wendy for all the un unbelievable things the Kauffman Foundation has been doing for really decades. Without them, you know, this entrepreneurship movement would not have the momentum. It has Ross for you know, kind of Village Capital and Bill, Bill Cap communities and hosting us uh, to all 16 of these uh, came from you know, all, all over, literally all over the country uh, to, to be here. But most of all, thank you to all of you for, for being here and sticking, sticking with it to really celebrate what's happening with all these different the communities. The rest really is, is rising, but it will require continued engagement and, and support. And there will be times where I'm sure there will be doubters and skeptics. That's always the case when you're doing something important, but I'm reminded of, of uh, at the great honor meeting probably 14, 15 years ago, Nelson Mandela at his home, that he said something I'll never forget uh, that, that inspires me to keep going on all these different issues, whether it's impact investing or inclusive entrepreneurship or the rise of the rest, which is it always seems impossible until it is done. So keep up the fight. Thank you.
I'm not going to try and top that for inspiration, but a few more thank yous. Um, there, this is a great crowd. We've had a great number of people in and out today. Um, thanks to all of our local partners in Salt Lake. The reason why stuff like this is happening is people like Boom Startups, Impact Hub, Church and State, Sustainable Startups, Beehive Startups. You guys are are creating the next true clinic, the next student loan genius, the next energy here. Um, so thanks to Cuisine, Unlead, Un Un Cuisine Unlimited for the happy hour uh, we're about to go enjoy. Um, thanks to Straight Up Technologies for the live stream. We got lots of great comments about the live stream. It worked great, better than any live stream I've seen. Gene Case even was sending in live stream comments. So we had, uh, we had uh, live stream fans at home. <laughs> Um, so thank and thank you. Thanks to our communities. Thanks to our judges and thank you for being here. Um, we have food, drinks, continue the conversation and thanks for a great day and thanks to the Village Capital team. Finally, last of all, who is Jared here, Heather here, Victoria here, Dustin here, who else? Zach is somewhere, Chris is somewhere, Brittany is right there. Bert was a was a bar a loner for the weekend. Thank you, Bert. You're you're really wonderful. Joseph, um, Ben, um, thanks a lot. We already Chris gets a times two thanks. Um, and I, I'm going to be the worst team member ever if I forgot all of you. Lewis just joined today, so um, thanks a lot. This has been great. So we're going to move chairs, so we're going to try to get the chairs out of the way. So if everybody wants to kind of move to the back, and if you see people moving chairs, it's the Village Capital team, so thank you. <laughs>